Thank you for having me. It's, it's nice to be here tonight. And I'd like to start off and tell you uh, a story. I'm going to tell you three stories tonight, so I hope I don't bore you. This is my first story. I don't know how well you can see this. This is the first ad I ever did as a marketer, right? It was for Legs Pantyhose. I worked for Legs Pantyhose. I know more about pantyhose than I need to, actually. Um, but it, it was my, my first job, you know? And so your first job, you're a assistant marketing manager, uh, associate, I don't know, some title like that, right? And uh, uh, so, so you're, you're working on a brand. That's kind of cool, you know? And, and what you realize is you spend, uh, at least you did then, in, in kind of traditional packaged goods marketing, you spend a lot of time doing data, right? Because the people who've graduated to brand manager and senior brand manager and, and director uh, don't like to do data anymore. Actually, I, I like some do, but, but you, you crunch a lot of data. So we had a problem at Legs. Uh, we had a problem. Uh, our sister brand, uh, Hanes, had about 25% of its customer base uh, was, was African American. It over-indexed with African American consumers, right? Legs was about 4%. We we're like, what, what's, what's up with that? You know, that, that doesn't make any sense. You know, it, it, how could these brands be so different, right? And we spent a lot of time looking at IRI and Nielsen and all the data in the world and, and, and just didn't get any good answers, right? I don't see a lot of hands. How many people use Facebook? You use AI every single day. Facebook is a big piece of AI, right? Here's the interesting. They just experiment on Facebook and they, they had 86,000 people participate in this experiment, and they wanted, you had to answer 100 personality questions, right? And what they wanted to do was see how well their AI could predict your answers, right? If you had liked 10 things on Facebook, they could predict your answers better than a coworker, right? If you had liked 150 things on Facebook, they could, pre they could predict your answer better than a friend. And if you would like just 300 things, they could predict your answers better than your spouse, right? There, there may be a reason that you get divorce ads in your Facebook. I'm just saying, Facebook. <laughs> if you, those start showing up, you may want to have some, some conversations. So, so one, of my, one of my first uh, experiences is, uh, when I left Legs, I went to work for a company called Picture Vision. Picture Vision was digitizing photos and putting them on the web, right? And none of you will think that's impressive, but in 1999, that was awesome, right? It was pretty cool. And uh, we were the back end of a, of a product called America Online, You've Got Pictures, right? Anybody have an AOL email address? I think that's kind of, I think it's kind of cool, do you? Yeah, I, I think I may go get, go use mine again, just because whenever I see one with somebody now, I'm like, dang, man, that guy's got an AOL address. That's pretty cool. So, so I can remember clearly being in a meeting, and uh, Kodak had just acquired our company. They had just bought our company. We were in Herndon, Virginia, and we, we were having a meeting with the Kodak marketing team and our marketing team. Now, our marketing team was was, was a card carrying startup, right? We had dogs in the office, free sodas, ping pong machine, you know, all the, the stuff you gotta have to be a, a full startup, especially in dot-com one. The Kodak team, what do you think the average tenure of a Kodak employee was at that time? 25, yeah, 22 years. Yep, 22 years. It was, you, did you work for Kodak? Yeah, so, so yeah, it was a lot. So the, the, we were talking about, you know, how are we going to manage the digital transition? The, the VP of marketing says it's not a problem. Mom is never going to trust her family's memories to ones and zeros. It was a quote. And I remember clear as day, I went home and did my resume that night. Because I'm like, we out. This is, this, is, this is out. And so second story, second picture. I, uh, I literally left. And... About three years ago, this, this ran in the, uh, I don't know, whatever this is, Wall Street Journal or something, and I keep this in my, um, my office as well. It's the danger of not changing. You know, Kodak was the most recognized brand in the world. They stood for pictures, except they didn't. They stood for film and paper, right? And, and, and they, they, didn't, they either didn't realize that or didn't want to realize that, and, and it, it, it killed the company, right? So. It, if you think about it, um, 
retail is going through this today at a, at a really rapid pace. If you think about that curve, it's happening to retail in amazing ways right now. It's a little scary, right? This was the first book I ever read. It's a book called Open Brand. It's by a woman named Kelly Mooney. I read this book in 2007, and this was the, uh, this, this was the page that struck me the most, that the purchase funnel's dead, the consumer's moving all over the place, and, and we're gonna have to think about how to reach them when they do. I still think this graph is as relevant as, as it ever was. Uh, and, and highly recommend this book, it's a quick read. Um, fast forward, uh, it, this is the, the book that I read when I got a job at Walmart. I had joined Walmart in, uh, in Arkansas to be on the food marketing team. Groceries, right? Great, great job, access to everything. Uh, I was, uh, I was uh, on the dry grocery team. Our sales the first year I was at Walmart were $51 billion. Uh, that's half, was half of Walmart groceries. You have to take zeros off everything to even comprehend it. Uh, and we had three marketers on a $51 billion business, right? So it, it's how Walmart runs lean. One day I'm in the gym at Walmart. Uh, somebody comes up to me and says, hey, we'd like you to help found and start an emerging media team. I'm like, awesome because I'm kind of fired up guy. And I uh, said, so what in the heck is emerging media? Right, you know, I said, but I'll do it, you know? And they said, it was defined for me as everything beyond the, the banner ad. So, so if you think about it at that time, in 2007, 2008, Facebook was just coming out of the ground. Matter of fact, it, it wasn't long before you couldn't even be on Facebook unless you were a college student, right? And, and Twitter was just starting. A lot of these things, uh, location, a lot of these things were just happening. I said, man, this sounds like a way to fail bigly and get your face name on the, 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 the Wall Street Journal for the wrong reason. I want a pixelized Wall Street Journal picture one day. It's kind of a bucket list item. I don't want one because I screwed up worse than anybody else has screwed up in marketing. That, that, you know. But either way, I'll take it. Um, so so what, what I found is I started Googling saving money on groceries and, and saving money, kind of Walmart's core, core brand propositions. And time after time, I found really cool content that was written by bloggers. It wasn't from Walmart. It wasn't from, from other people. It was written by bloggers. I said, oh, that's kind of cool. So I, I began to reach out to some of these folks and say, hey, tell me about what you do. And, and I just became fascinated with what they did because they were, they were better voices. Can you imagine if Walmart wrote an article about saving money, how awesome that would be? Yeah, me either. I mean, you know, Walmart's job is not to tell you how to save money. It's to stock things and price them and have a great logistics so you save money. So, I, but I was fascinated by this form of media because this was people as media, right? And, and we had this, this really interesting thing happen. Um, Apple had decided they were going to start selling the, the iPhone at Walmart. They did not sell the iPhone at Walmart the first year and a half, two years that it was out. And, and Walmart pointed out very astutely that they sell more iPods at the time than Apple sold. Maybe their customers ready for the iPhone. I don't know. Makes sense. So we're going to launch it. We're having a meeting. We're talking about it. We're like, gosh, the purchase experience is probably going to be uh, less good, right? You know, I, I think I use a stronger word, but you know, it was less good. So I said, so, hey, uh, why don't we give our 11 moms, these, this, this blogger group that we had started, why don't we give them gift cards, have them go along the path to purchase, and purchase iPhones, and we'll see what happens, right? And I said, yeah, that sounds pretty good. It's kind of like a folks group, right? Now, I knew in the back of my head they were going to create content about it. I didn't mention this to any of my colleagues at Walmart because they would have flipped out, and we would have never have done it. It was awesome. They wrote great articles. There are, and their articles weren't, oh, Walmart's great, they got the iPhone, who cares? Their articles were about how the iPhone is a relevant tool for them. These are all money-saving bloggers to save money, right? And, and it connected to people and people used it and they shared it and we had, we, we had uh, you know, we were able to use it on our channels at Walmart and so I'm like, this is pretty cool. The really interesting, unexpected thing that happened was all of that content attached itself to those Google, Google searches. And so the connection between Walmart and the iPhone in Google's eyes got enhanced. I said, huh, this is a business. This is kind of cool. We built a platform. We built this 11 moms platform. We packaged this in media buys 
that our that our suppliers could buy, Procter and Gamble and and Campbell's and, and, and Disney and other folks, and we sold it just like we'd sell any other cooperative media. And it was great. It, it, it's a program that lasted at Walmart until just last year. And this was great. It also had a, a trade effect. We were listed that year as the most, you know, the, the best retail brand in globally, right? And, and the 11 Moms was called out exactly the way we intended it is, it is a way for real people to create a con conduit to the media that, that we're connecting with. Make sense? Ish. Um, so so we, we uh, I have a business partner named Ted Rubin. He was doing the same thing at the time with Elf Cosmetics. Anybody know Elf? Yeah, it's a pretty good brand, right? So at that time, Elf was just direct to consumer. It was just online only. Ted said, I had a budget of $5.22 for global marketing, and he had discovered the same thing. He had discovered beauty bloggers who, who would create content and help him connect in real ways. Elf is a big brand now. They have a whole, they have a whole run, you know, just sold for, I think, a billion two, uh, or just went public for, for I think, in the, in the low billions range. Um, we partnered in a new company in 2009 called Collective Bias. And Collective Bias sought to, to think about how do we use people media in a, in a larger context, right? And, and how do we use it specifically applied to, uh, to shopper marketing and to trade marketing? And, and so we built a, a platform to be able to do that, to, to, to help us manage uh, the, the, what, what was you know, 11 moms, which became 3,000 influencers and to create content for brands connected to a channel, right? And, and that company grew and it did well. We were, uh, our, our uh, angel investor was a guy named Ken Barnett who uh, it, it runs a, a company called Mars Advertising, one of the largest shopper marketing agencies in the world. And it, it, it was great, grew. Uh, we, we raised venture capital in 2013. Um, and, and like, as I mentioned, the company sold uh, late last year. Uh, and then the, get to today, and what we're gonna talk about tonight is Prevailing Path, our new company. And if you keep thinking about people media being one of the most influential medias that, that's available, and the connection of AI, really being able to understand who is interested in my message, um, there's something interesting at that crossroads that I, that I think we can, we, we can, we can attack. So, so let's go back a little bit about, about Shopper Media. So uh, Piggly Wiggly is without a doubt my favorite grocery store still to this day. I love the pig, as, as you know, the trade people call it. So the way Piggly Wiggly talked to you in 1950 was they talked to you in store, which is the way most people experience them, and they had an ad in your Wednesday and your, your uh, Sunday paper. So you could plan for your stuff, right? I remember this pretty, that's how they spent most of their trade dollars. And when I say they spent their dollars, what I really meant is they spent their suppliers' dollars. You know, retailers don't pay for their own media. Um, today, this was last week in Walmart. Today, the, the marketing really hasn't changed if you think about it. Even in digital, this is Facebook or, yeah, this is Facebook. Um, Still talking about price and item and promotion. On a digital channel, don't really care, right? That's nice. Walmart has 33 million followers on Facebook. I think uh, 800 people engaged here. I don't know what that rate is, but it's, it's pretty low. But basically, nobody cares, right? So, so if they cared, they would be engaging and sharing and, and whatever. But wait, we got big data, right? Watson is going to solve the problem. If you're for IBM, Watson, you know, Watson's going to solve the problem. Except that this is IBM's earnings for the past 26 quarters. I'm sorry, revenue. So Watson, maybe Watson's just catching up with how to do business. Maybe, you know, they ticked up here. They've got all this data, and yet they can't figure out how to use it to drive their own revenue. I'm skeptical. I, I believe in it, but I... I, I I'm skeptical, right? Um, what's the problem? Anybody know Moneyball? You like this, like this movie? What's the problem? What was the problem for the, the Oakland A's? 
Why weren't they winning? They had the lowest, the, the lowest salaries in, in Major League, right? I think the Yankees were spending 120 million, they were spending 30 or 40, right? I love this speech. He's like, there's good teams, there's bad teams, there's 50 feet of shit, and then there's us, right? We cannot win the same. The problem is, I believe, in retail, uh, and they're more than that, uh, digital marketing does not work the same way traditional marketing works, and yet we're still using it that way. First of all, this number represents one third of digital marketing last year is fake, right? This is WPP study, one of the biggest ad holding companies out there. $16 billion is either fraud or it's bots, right? Problem is bots don't eat a lot of cheeseburgers. So if McDonald's is using digital marketing and a third of it's fake, like, that seems like a solvable problem, but it's not. It's getting worse. You know, it, it, it's getting worse. So, so here's, that's, what, that's the first problem. The second is, who has this experience? You open a fortune cookie, a dream will be fulfilled by the flat screen TV in your shopping cart, right? Retargeting is everywhere. It's almost like everybody said at once, oh, digital, it's transactional. Every time I touch a customer, I'm gonna say, hey, buy something, right? I mean, it, it, it will be in a fortune cookie soon, I have no doubt, right? But you'll, you'll look at some shoes online and you'll get a, a fortune cookie for that. All right, this is, this is something that blew my mind the other day. This is a real ad in a trade journal called Shopper Marketing Magazine. Here's this happy woman. She's on her lunch break. She's checking out her Facebook page or maybe reading the news or whatever and gets a pop-up. Hey! There's a $1.99 ground beef right down the street at Harris Teeter. Who freaking cares? And I marketers all the time, they say, oh, well, this, the, no, this works. This works. Yeah, it works because you showed it to 10 million people and three said, oh, shit, I got to go buy some hamburger. No, it makes people, it annoys people. I go, to, I go to big marketing conferences all the time and speak and I go, how many people love retargeting ad, retargeted ads? Does anybody here love retargeting ads? Do you? Does anybody buy retargeting ads for people that you're trying to reach? I love your honesty, thank you. Yeah, I, I just, you know, so it works. Is it doing damage to your brand? I would suggest yes, in making your brand less relevant, unless it is really, really, really at a moment, and that ain't the moment, to talk to that woman about hamburger. Yeah. If it's not a retargeted, it's going to be an ad, right? You know, I, I, I don't, I, by the way, I don't know. And, and, and I say that with 100% with humility, because I, I think most people don't know. Um, I just know... The, the click rates for this stuff is less than banner ads, like, like by, by a factor of two or three, which just tells me people aren't interested. So you're basically just spamming people. So, so yes, I, there's nothing wrong with ads, it, it, but what form are ads? In, in, in your business, there are times that I need to know, man, I gotta do something exciting to get this retailer excited. I need, I need help with my, my, my visual display, right? Whatever, there are times, but what will I do if I need that? I'll go Google it. I'll network at an event like this. I'll do something. I can find that information, you know? So I, I, don't, don't get me wrong that I'm beating up ads because I'm not. I'm beating up the way they're used. And then I think this is the other thing is the, the immediate response is we're going to have a sale, right? Dix, Target, and Kroger all came out in the past two weeks in response to getting hammered in the stock market and said, oh, no problem, we're gonna cut prices, right? What's that gonna do? It's gonna kill margins. Who owns low price? Walmart. It's not, this is not your gig, you know? Simplicity, in, 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 again, in my humble opinion, is the new EDLP. EDLP was Walmart's strategy that, that, that grew them to where they are. Everyday low price, you knew when you went to Walmart, they might not have the lowest price, but day in and day out, they had, they had lowest prices. Of, of, they didn't play high-low games. 
I believe simplicity is, is the new thing. You tell me about a book that you read that you really liked, I can take out my phone, I can look up that book, and I can have that book on the way to my house in about how long? <laughs> click, click. It's the click, click. <laughs> click, right. Make it easy for people, and that, that's the whole chain. I believe also, and this is a big prediction, and please tweet this and say I'm crazy, that the store will not be the dominant model in 10 years. How much is, how much is e com today? Everybody, this, this is the answer you'll get if you say that. How much is e com today in the US? Eight, nine percent maybe of total retail. Um, in China, it's double, right? So you don't have to believe me. There's, there's smart people who also think this. Um, and I read them, that's why I believe this too. This is not 2001, the last mile problem is going to be solved by every physical thing available. Your Uber driver is gonna bring you stuff. Your employees from a store on the way home are gonna bring stuff. Amazon is, is experimenting with sinking products in a lake and, and being able to float them and put them into a box so no human has to touch them. I'm not kidding. I mean, it's, it's, you know, everything that can be investigated is, and it's going to make it easier to get to you without friction, you know? Um, this is a stat that I saw today. 2021, less than 50, right? That's four years away. So I, I think that the store model is going to have to, evolve into into something different so I love this slide this to me is the modern purchase funnel right we built these nice sidewalks here people walk there so we put up a sign right and anyway, you know and then what the heck is this woman doing <laughs> <laughs> this is a digital shopper you got all these things, you got all these, these ways, these CRM, everything you're gonna get them into places. They're like, screw it, I'm walking through the bushes. You know, <laughs> not telling me where to go. Um, and then we're very focused on last touch attribution, right? Where did that click come from that sold the thing, right? Google recently d looked at their data and they said a new car buyer has 900 digital touches. Which one sold the car? Which one? Oh, 901. Yeah, I, I, the problem is we're still in a brand environment. You know, this is the new uh, uh, Porsche uh, E Mission. Pretty, pretty smart marketers there at, at Porsche, right? E Mission, get it? Uh, that's their new uh, Tesla fighter, right? I can't stop looking at this car because I think it's so cool, you know. And, and, but which one are they is going to get attribution for if I went and bought one of those, right? It would be the salesperson that I called, or be, and I won't buy that from a salesperson if I ever bought it. I would just order it online, I'm sure, right? I never talk to a salesperson, which would be fine. Um, we think a lot at Prevailing Path about this part of the, the funnel because you know, when I am looking for visual displays, I'm gonna go find information, you know? I'm gonna go get inspiration maybe from, uh, from Pinterest. Can you imagine looking at Pinterest for visual displays? Of course, because I bet you there are thousands, if not tens of thousands of great visual displays on Pinterest or wherever, right? It, it doesn't matter, I'm walking through the bushes in, in that picture. Thinking about what do people find in any channel when they're, when they're looking for information. You know, how, how can we, how can we one, evaluate that, and then how can we populate those channels? Here's two, uh, two shoppers at Target, right? And, and she has two phones. That's my daughter, by the way. And she does not have two phones. She is lifting phones from her parents. Uh, and that's my wife. But my wife uses Cartwheel and, and what's Target's other thing? I don't, I don't even, even know what the systems are, but. Uh, it's a target app, yeah, target app. Yeah, I, see, I wouldn't even think about that because I'm a different shopper, right? So, so they're shopping in the store, but, but completely so, you know, somewhere else. How, what is the, the, the state of the content that they're finding as they're looking? Because they're looking for something. This is the other thing. 
which is really interesting. Uh, it started with consumer electronics, but now it, it, is, it is morphing to other categories, including consumer packaged goods. Uh, Amazon is becoming the dominant search engine for, for stuff. You know, it's the search engine stuff. It's not Google. They pass Google in, in many categories, but it's also not other uh, other forms. It's not retailers. So, so people are defaulting that that channel is where they're going to look for stuff. That doesn't mean they're buying it there, but if they're already there, they're they're, they're probably buying it there. Um, and, and I think you know what's interesting about that. Amazon will say. Anybody know how much media Amazon will sell this year? Anybody? Take a guess. They'll sell three and a half billion dollars in media this year. Next year, they'll be the third largest digital media company. And media, unlike their stuff business, has awesome margins, right? They're making great margins. That's how they're funding the rest. So having a price war with Amazon is a pretty dumb idea because they're going to fund it with media and with AWS, with services. Um, and, and, and I think they're doing that. I actually think Amazon could be a bigger media company than it is a stuff company. Because it's going to connect you to people who, it'll be the dominant channel for connecting you. So I'll show you how that works. Um, anybody order stuff from Alexa? Yeah, what'd you order? Whatever, yeah. So Alexa has two secret daily deals. You, you just say, Alexa, what are your deals today? And it's got two deals a day. And usually they're pretty good. Sometimes they're crazy stuff, but it, they're, they're, they're funny. So, so here's what's happening today in the battery category. Um, it is, is Alexa is narrowing the shelf to two items. So if you ask Alexa today, hey Alexa, I'd like to order some uh, AA batteries. Alexa say, Alexa recommends, what do you think the first product is they recommend? They recommend Alexa brand batteries as their first one because they've identified it as a category that they want to own because it's the second largest basket category behind bananas. Uh, the second one you say, no, I don't want that. Alexa will say Duracell, the, the category leader, right? What effect do you think that has on battery, the battery category online? Who owns it, do you think? So right now, Alexa owns, or Amazon owns 93% of batteries online. And of that, 60% is their own brand. Online, Amazon brand batteries are the, the dominant battery category, ahead of Duracell, ahead of other, other brands. This should scare the life out of you if you're a brand. Because what this says to me is brands don't matter, right? I, don't, I think brands matter. I, I would be in the wrong profession if I didn't, but I think that's an amazing stat, and it's being driven because of the way that people are looking at the channel. So we'll get to, like, why influencers then? Why is influencer marketing so powerful? What's the most powerful kind of marketing? Person-to-person. Person, person, especially who? Trust. Yeah, trust who, but what person? Family first, friends second. If your family or friends tell you something, you'll, you'll typically, you'll, you'll have transference trust of, of that, that product, right? The, the next is influencers. And, and I think when, when you say influencers, people have this idea of Kim Kardashian and stuff like that. They're, certainly they're influencers and that's a, that's a category. But everyday influencers are super powerful because they have networks, but that's not why they're, they're the most powerful. They're the most powerful because they affect the AI. Right? They affect what the AI systems think about what people like. Because they're just trained to look and see what are people sharing with each other. Um, this is a, a company that we've done some, I used to work for here, uh, M Plus. Um, we launched a new brand uh, about a year and a half ago called Force Field. And it's a sneaker protector spray in the uh, high end sneaker protector spray for sneaker heads. Right, for people who are really into sneakers. Like that's a you know, 15, 20 dollar product depending on where you buy it. And, and they had two kind of big competitors. So we used sneakerheads to help us create content and, and to help train the algorithms of people in the sneakerhead space to think about that, right? 
and it had a pretty dramatic effect. One is, by populating the channels, it dominates what Google finds. If you do a search for a brand name, it's not as bad as it was uh, uh, just three or four years ago, but you'll still find mostly logos and pictures of people getting their five-year pin, right? It, 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 what Google thinks about your company is, oh, they've got pretty logos and people getting five-year pins, right? Not, this is the kind of stuff that we do and how you use product and inspiration and whatever. This is, this is the beginning of thinking about what is along the prevailing path that people are finding. Here's the impact that we really like. So there are two big brands in the space, Jason Mark and the Orange and Crep, who just owned the share of voice when this brand was launched. And in six, seven, eight, nine months, um, Force Field, a brand new, brand, brand new entrant, had become the dominant share of voice in the space. Right? Yes? Uh, this is uh, Sysimos, I believe, and, and I can tell you exactly, uh, but I think it's Sysimos. Uh, but I mean, any of the platforms would measure that for you. You know, uh, radiant, uh, you know there's, there's a bunch of them. Crimson Hexagon, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, this, uh, so share voice. And we use, we, we use 10, 12 inputs when, whenever we're looking at something like this because we find differences. So if you measure them over the time, I don't know if you use clout. A lot of people say, oh, cloud's BS, cloud's great. Cloud's consistent. <laughs> so, you know, over, over time, I can compare cloud and at least have a directional, you know, directional kind of look. So the idea is, how do we use content, a prevailing path is, how do we use content to get to commerce, right? And how do we do it in a predictable way that is not interrupting you with an ad as you're doing something else, telling you about hamburger being on sale, which is really important, but Maybe not something that I want to think about. This is the for one of the first prevailing path scores. I mentioned clout because we built it very much like clout. We started with about 45 inputs and created a logarithmic score. Uh, so, so each e e each level of e each level is another 10, and, and just created a score. Right. By the way, it doesn't mean anything. It's just relative to other things. So we, we went out to visit Amazon a few months ago and, and talked to them about Amazon Fresh. And, and we just wanted to look at, you know, what, what, what's a general sense uh, of what people are finding along the prevailing path for Amazon Fresh? And, and what does that mean? Where are, they, where are they finding it? Where are the engagement? What is the engagement level like? How are they sharing it? Lots of, lots of different kinds of things. And so we created this score. Uh, and, and we said, hey, you know, we, we kind of like that. Let's look at some other things, right? How many people are going to share something tonight on your social media about your carpet cleaner? Anyone? You will? <laughs> right. Now, now, let me ask you something. When would you use social media about carpet cleaning? If they, if they your carpet. So, so maybe if you had a problem. Recos. Yeah, yeah, recos, right? I use Facebook all the time. Hey, I'm going to this city. Where should I eat? Uh, I'd like to buy a sat phone. I was just in a, in a place where I didn't have any service for about five days and kind of flipped out a little bit. And uh, I'm like, I got to have a way to tell my wife I'm alive, right? Uh, so, so I don't know. Anybody know anything about sat phones? Please see me later. But I just put on Facebook. Anybody got a sat phone? Right? People talk about it. People are like, yeah, you got to get an Iridium. It's only $75 a month and, you know, whatever. I, I don't know anything about sat phones, but now I do because, you know, I've got, I've got crowdsourcing. Yeah. If you or your kid spills something, or your dog, thank you, uh, spill something on your carpet, a lot of people would go to that as a crowdsource. Or what else would you do? You'd Google it, right? Let me, just, let me just save you some, some uh, things you don't want to unsee. You don't want to Google carpet stain, all right? <laughs> Trust me on this. But what an opportunity for a company like, or for a brand like Stainmaster, a, a Georgia Pacific brand, to create things for people to find that are relevant. 
there are categories that things that people spill, right? There are things that happen when you clean your carpet. Anybody ever clean their carpet? And, and, and then, then what happens to that spot? It's clean, and then what happens? You remove all the finish on the carpet so it attracts extra dust. You always have what they call a ghost stain. Anybody ever heard that term? So that's a term that they created a product to, to create. Create content about it, right? 28 is not a high score. We could move that maybe to a 50. Again, the scores don't really mean anything except the, rele the relevance of how much stuff I'm finding along that, that activity. We then begin to, to uh, try to understand, can we train the AI? And we look to content to do that. So we asked some influencers that we know, Dawn in this case, to go along the path to purchase to get a, a stain cleaner recommendation. And Dawn has a pretty big, she, she, she and her, her uh, business partner run a, uh, a platform called Party Blueprints. It's a great you know, entertaining blog and, and things. And, and carpet spills would be something they would naturally talk about. She created content. We monitored the analytics of who engaged with that and how it began to affect the algorithms of different different things. It's very, very minimal. But what we were able to do is build a model that we knew uh, the, for the next piece of content that we created, how to create a more impactful, more efficient piece of content, who to talk to about it, and where to put it. And, and, and this is what we hope to accomplish. This is, you know, very early days. This is what we hope to accomplish uh, it, I spilled it. How big is it still? Is it big? Like, a little, like, I don't like, I like, but, but it's like this. <laughs> So by producing some content and putting it into the space organically as Dawn would naturally do, we don't direct the channel, we don't put paid media behind it, we don't do anything except observe. And we're observing for who engages. Because we want, we want to do is build a model that I don't have to spam you with to get messaging to you when you need it. And, and when we do that, we, we can get increasing levels of efficiency out of the digital media that we're buying, as well as figure out what kinds of content work and the audience likes. And then for a marketer like me who grew up on demographics, we can understand who we should really be talking to versus who we think we should be talking to. Why did we use market segmentation and demographics 20 years ago? And we still use it today, but it doesn't work today like it. Sure. So if you wanted to reach 50-something-year-old dudes, where did you advertise? Newspapers and Sports Illustrated. Yeah, we use demographic targeting because that's how the media platforms were aligned, right? Does every 50 cent something year old dude like sports? No, right? Do 50 year old something women like sports? Yes. Why do you care who the target is except that you respect the fact that they are interested in what you got to say and have content ready for them versus interrupting them? It didn't matter when it was on TV and we could ignore it. When it's on my cell phone, I want to kill you. And I want, to, I want to never, ever use your brand again and tell people that, right? And, and I think that, that this is a fundamental difference. And then we can map what conversations matter. How does, this, how does this relevant to the person who we now know is interested in this that we may never have known before? And we know it because they or, people are organically engaging with this content. So when we do use paid media, it becomes hyper efficient. And hopefully we're not bugging people because that, that's, that's really the, the ultimate goal. And, and we're able to see the, the conversation and, and the biggest conversation going online is children and stains. 
If I was in this business, if I was Georgia Pacific and Stain Master, I would make lots of content about children in stains, right? Because it works. We actually found a, a, a different route because we also experiment with some, some uh, uh, media properties, some digital media properties we own. We have a, a media property called Pints, Forks, and Friends. It's about the love of craft beer. We started a conversation on that, that community. It's about 50,000 people about what's the best craft beer you've ever spilled on your carpet. That was an awesome conversation. Awesome conversation. We had, within a couple hours, we had two, 300 responses and conversations going on in that conversation. It is a place you could go and play because people are spilling their favorite craft beer on their carpet. And Stainmaster could own that market in a relevant way. Does that make sense? So, does anybody know uh, Belkin's Wemo products? It's a IoT. It's a pretty, pretty cool line. Uh, Kieran Hannon, who's the CMO of this brand, is a good friend of ours, gave us some, some products to try. And, and so we, we were like, okay, let, let's do the same thing. So now we're using Dawn again and her husband, Mark, who shop for IoT very differently. Right? And this is where we're beginning to map the path. Again, this is all done manually. Uh, we, we will eventually uh, automate this, but, but this is all. The, Mark went directly to Amazon. Dawn went to a blog. Mark clicked on the product, learned more about it. Dawn clicked on the page to see what people had to say about it. They both looked at ratings and reviews. Mark's like, nope, I want to see it. He went to Home Depot or Lowe's or something. Dawn ordered it online, right? Paths. If we can quantify these in terms of engagement, we can create amazing marketing that helps people along the path to purchase, not gets in their way. And that's our goal of all the experimentation. Everybody know House Autry, North Carolina brand? Love those guys. Um, you know, House Autry, same thing. House Autry has a very tight target, and, and we will eventually talk to that target. But what we said to them at, at the beginning was, let's figure out who wants to talk about this. And we produced a, uh, a video about a, a macaroni and cheese that was finished on a, on a smoker, a green egg, and it was awesome. And guys loved it. And, and ate it up. Women did not, right? Not, not surprising, that's okay. Who are we, who are we talking to? It does, doesn't really matter. We were able to then build a persona. This is the first persona we've built that predicts how much money we need to invest to get an outcome from this audience. So, so our, our goal is to be able to, to say, if you invest a dollar, you get X as an outcome, and that X could be, could be brand defined. So it could be, I want somebody to my website, I want somebody in my social, I need to drive somebody in store. I don't care. Tell us what the X is, and we will tell you the cost. And it might not be an efficient X. You may have to spend more than its value, then great, let's do something else, right? And I'll, I'll, show, you, I'll show you a quick example of that. My new Paula's Choice, it's a, digital uh, skincare brand. Uh, Paula's Choice is interesting. We, we went into much more heavy uh, shopper content here. So here's this shopper's path. Here's the thing that she's doing. Here's her story about how her skin's damaged from going to the beach and all of the things that, that she did. And, and we're able to see this begin to affect the, the results for Paula's Choice across a variety of platforms by using, using these measurement tools. Um, when we, when we get to paid, and this is where we're now going into live test, we were pretty proud of this result. How, how much can you buy engagements for today if you go to Facebook? Anybody know? Roughly? Yeah. Yeah. 30 cents. Yep. Yeah. Uh, three cents. It depends on the category. Highly competitive categories would be more, some would be less. This is a half a cent a piece, right? And this is the first pass we made at this. Our, our goal in, in this type of, of content production, learning, and, and, and rinse and re-impeat would be to do this a thousand times so that we get really, really hyper-efficient. By the way, we're not even close to this yet. We're, we're in a learning mode. 
But this is what we want to find out is who do we talk to? Who's most engaged? Who's least engaged? What, what is good about this content and, and, and how can we use it to, to drive predictable outcomes? Um, and then this is, this is kind of the, the, the final, this is a goal we've been working on, kind of like the, the genome decoding project is, can we affect organic Google search by just using content, right? This is a much harder problem. And to date, we've been at this about nine months, 10 months, to date we haven't been able to do it. It's pretty demeaning, like when you go home every day and you're like, I failed. You know, but that's, that's how, you know, how you kind of get to it. This is the first time, this is a company we work with here in town called Regency 360. This is my dog, right? Uh, this is a blog post that we created about a, a canine water bottle, a promotional water bottle, right? Um, with this blog post, and, and when we started working with, with this, and that product is a highly competitive product. It's carried everywhere. It's sold on Amazon. Sold direct. It's sold by, by lots of promotional companies. So, so you know, the ability to stick out with this single product in a Google search is hard, right? Using just this blog post and, and our distribution model with with influencers, we were able. This is the seven or eight result now organic on Google. This is not SEO. This is not paid. This is not something that I have to keep reinvesting in. I will keep reinvesting for, for more uh, content. But now our client's product that, that they would like to connect with, with people are looking, it's a hot product right now, it is now affecting Google and, and other channels. And this is the ultimate result of what we want to be able to do is provide content that shows up as, as consumers are in, in active mode. Yes, sir. We're not, and, and it's a good question, uh, we, we, except for monitoring, we're not at all. We, we don't do any managed SEO. Um, we, it's, just, it's just not our business, and, and we will get to that, but we'll partner with somebody who's good at it. So what do you think is, is uh, why is this happening? Um, I think most of the content, out, actually I know, most of the content out there is pictures of bottles. I mean, if, 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 if I had to, I'm not the, the analytics person. They could tell you a, 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 an actual reason why. I'm a marketer. Would you click on a bottle or a dog? <laughs> right, right? I mean, it, it, and, and I think it, it actually doesn't matter whether you would, Google is also processing that same thing. And Google's going, well, there's a lot of this. And I know people love these, <laughs> right? What's the marketing shortcut? Dogs, cats, kids, donuts. Uh, you know, what, 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 one, of, one of the one of the one of the you know Fab Four. Uh, the the I, I really believe it. And by the way, don't fully know the answer to that question. I'll be very transparent about that. Um, we, we're we're trying to understand that. You know, and what we're trying to understand is okay. So now we have this result. How do we turn that into outcomes, into lead generation, and, and that kind of stuff for our client? I guess that in the end, how do you measure? Well, the, the outcomes that they want is leads. They want, they want leads. They're a promotional you know, agency. So the outcome that we'll, we'll drive with this is to try to drive lead gen uh, for people coming. And, and by the way, that's one product. We'll do 1,000. It, it does, it, it, it does, but, but at a point, um, if we can get someone to come in and, and show interest, and there's all kinds of back-end tracking, there's all kinds of back-end tracking to do that, um, they can take it from there. Our job is this handoff, right? It, it, you know, when we started with them, they indexed for zero words. They now index for 200, and I, I think you know, we've gotten eight or ten that they care about in, in places. Now, there are some that are going to be really hard, but I, I was talking with, with um, someone in the audience about wedding dresses. Like if you wanted to do this for wedding dresses, uh, we, could, we could figure it out and tell you the amount of content that you would need to produce, but it's going to be a lot. But think about wedding dress digital marketing today. It happens in a really interesting way. 
Anybody get engaged recently? Did you put that picture up on Instagram? Right? And then what happened? Congratulations. What happened after you put that picture up? You got a million likes. Okay, good, good, good. Did you start getting all kinds of wedding targeting? Yeah. yeah. That picture is a is a is a paid trigger for anybody selling anything related to wedding stuff, right? No, I mean it totally makes sense, right? It totally makes sense. But how many are you getting at once? And what kind of wedding dress do you already know that you want to buy? You've been thinking about it longer than this day, right? So, so again, back to, the, back to the, the, Google, the attribution model, it can hit you with every, you know, David's bridal, blah, 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 add to death. And I will, if I'm a, a marketer doing, doing that, um, you're not going to care. It's just going to be noise. Now you're going to want to go more information about, you know, awesome bridal showers and whatever. I don't know. I got married a long time ago. But, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that you, you can think about these pathways. Branding, ha marketing hasn't changed. We still have to have brands be relevant. It can't all just be a paid last click. And, and so the first thing that you have to do is be able to map that. The second thing you have to do is be able to, to test and, and improve models and then figure out how do we convert those outcomes. If you're doing SEO and everybody's doing SEO, it's going to end up the same, you know, the same. Nobody, ha nobody has a magic SEO button. You know, everybody will tell you they do, but they use the same processes. Yeah. 